All right. Good morning. It is our last week in the book of Colossians. I'm not a very disciplined person in life. I just like to do what feels good in the moment. Blake, he's super disciplined, so I feel even less disciplined with him around. So to get to like the end of a whole book of the Bible, I'm like, wow, I really accomplished something. So I hope you feel a sense of accomplishment this morning. We made it all the way through an entire book of the Bible. So congratulations. And I feel excited to bring us home, Colossians 4. And this is a really fun passage of scripture. If you haven't read it yet, we're going to be in Colossians 4, 2 through 18 this morning. I'll have someone read it for us here in a minute. Misha, you be down for that? Amisha, would you be down to read it? You have a minute. You can say no, too. It's a real question. You don't want to? All right, I'll get somebody else. All right. This is a really fun passage of Scripture because what happens in this passage is we kind of get a behind-the-scenes glimpse, right? It's kind of like our kids love to watch the bloopers at the end of a movie because all of a sudden you get to see the real people. You get to see their humanity. You get to see the people behind the roles. And that's kind of what this passage is because we know Paul the Apostle. We know Colossians, the Bible book, but in this passage, we get to see the friends, we get to see the people, we get to see their real life relationships as they're slugging it out together for the gospel. And that's the church, right? It's a group of people slugging it out together for the gospel. I Googled slugging it out because I thought it might be a sports reference. I just want to make sure that it actually applied to what I'm saying, and it, it does, it does. So that's us, right? That is describing us. And so this morning, as we read this passage, try to picture us sitting in the crowd, hearing these final words of Paul's. Because the people hearing it, the people hearing his words this morning, like it's easy for us to view them as like super Christians, right? Like the OGs. But as you listen to his words, he is talking to people that have jobs. He is talking to people that have annoying neighbors, He's talking to people that have busy lives, okay? And so let's listen to what he's saying because it wasn't easy for them either to prioritize living a life that's fueled by this idea of Christ in me. But he totally gets that, and that's why he says what he says. So would somebody be willing to read it? Thank you, Ashley. Okay, it's, it's 2 through 18. I don't know if there's some hard names in there or not. If there are, sorry. There you go. <laughs> Perfect.
Awesome. Thanks, Ashley. So good. Amen. Okay, let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this picture of this vibrant group of people committed together to the gospel. Lord, would you be with us as we look at this this morning? Would you empower us by your Holy Spirit? I thank you that it is Christ in us that enables us to be a part of what you're doing. We thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. I love this passage. It's really easy to skip over it, kind of like when you get to the part of the Bible where it's like talking about how many cubits Noah's Ark is. You're like, "Uh uh-huh, uh-huh. But it's so rich. This is a really rich passage. So let's get into it. Okay, so verse 7 through 17, all these shout-outs, right? It's so fun. This is, this is the united in Christ in me calling, right? They're all united by this shared reality that Christ is in them and Christ is in me. This is across ethnic lines. This is across uh, countries and regions. Like this is a significant group coming together united by this one truth. And there is a love being expressed. Like if you really read these verses, you can see the love. You can see the fellowship. You can see the commitment to one another. It's really powerful. They're supporting each other. They're serving each other. They're praying for each other. They're letting each other stay at their house, right? They're hosting each other, feeding each other. What a fun thing to be a part of. What a fun thing to be a part of. And look, they were not going to church together. If we just go to church together, we're missing out on the fun. They were the church together. They were all in this thing, and they felt it, and they experienced the costliness of it, but they also experienced the joy because they were doing it together. It really would have probably have been much fun if they were all just grinding it out on their own, but they were together. And that is really what we want to continue to keep before us as a church. That this isn't mine and Blake's church. This isn't a church you come to. No, this is a rallying point for all of us. This is all of our church. And when we come on Sunday morning, the goal is that we would come together, that we would get in God's presence, that we would remember who God is. We're like, oh, yeah. We'd be filled up with the Holy Spirit, that we'd be equipped, that we'd be encouraged to go back out, right? And that's what was happening with this group. They all came together to read this letter, but then they were all sent back out to the places where God had put them. And that is what, God, that is what Paul's giving them in verse 2 through 6. This is his equipping. This is his exhortation for them as they're going to go back out and continue the work at which God's called them to. So let's look at that again, verse 2 through 6. Devote yourself to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Pray for us, too, that God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. This is why I'm here in chains. Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. Live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. Okay, what you're seeing here is a powerful evangelism strategy. And this is what I want to talk about this morning and equip us all in, because when you think of evangelism, certain things might come to mind, right? You might think of knocking on people's doors. You might think of go into a different city. You might think of confronting people at Walmart, or you might have been the person confronted at Walmart sometimes, right? And, and there's a place for those things as God leads you. But what I want to take us here is what Paul is describing is a really different kind of evangelism, right? It's this lifestyle of being ready, of making the most of every opportunity, of of having a desire to live a gracious and attractive life to those around you so that you can point them to Jesus. And when we look at scripture, we see that Jesus really actually did this too. That is how Jesus went about preaching the kingdom. Paul's saying, live wisely. Okay, this is about our conduct, our character. How are we living amongst people that don't know God? Make the most of every opportunity. Look for opportunities to speak about Jesus. Look for opportunities to reflect the kingdom. And do it in a gracious and attractive way. Right? It's so simple. It doesn't mean it's easy. Right? It doesn't mean it's easy to live a lifestyle where we're thinking that Christ is in me and that I can give that away to other people. But it's possible. 
and especially because it's Christ in us that enables us to do it. And so we're going to unpack that a little more this morning of what that looks like to do that in the places and spaces God's put you. You might not like where you are, but you're, all, you're there on purpose. So that can be your encouragement when you go to work tomorrow morning or you step outside and have to say hey to your neighbor or take care of your kids that might not listen to you. You're there on purpose. So I'm going to have Beav come up. You share a little, share for a surprise, it's time. Would you come share for a minute just about how God's using you and the places he's put you? Y'all give it up for Beav. All right. Can you hear me? It works. All right, I'm Beav. Uh, I am a high school teacher. I am a high school coach. I also coach junior high, and I deal with a lot of uh, different people. I deal with young ones, I deal with old ones, I deal with girls and boys, they're all different. Um, and that was not always my first choice. I didn't go to college to become a teacher. Uh, no offense, I mean, the pay is not great. And um, you spend a lot more hours coaching and teaching than you do other places. Uh, but God put me in this place, I got saved in college, and what's interesting about this message, um, you think about when you get saved, and what you do with what you know now than where you were before. And it's a, it's a life change. It's a drastic change. And, you know, I credit that to one person. Uh, when I was playing college ball, this kid named Thomas came up to me every day. I know this is not my job real quick, but if it wasn't for Thomas coming to me every Sunday, inviting me to church, I would have never met Jesus. Or maybe I wouldn't have met him at that time. But he came every Sunday. And then the last Sunday that he came, I said, no, man, I'm busy. I can't. I'm, he goes, no, you're not. I'm in your driveway. <laughs> and I said, you know what? And then he mentioned, you know, there was going to be a lot of girls and a lot of pizza. And I said, well, I'm in. <laughs> so he got me there. But because of that one person doing his job, he changed me. Well, Jesus changed me, but he got me to that place, and now I'm a coach and a teacher um, just witnessing to people and seeing how hungry these young people are, and they need people to speak. They need people to follow to see what it's like, that it's not boring, it's not miserable, but it is fun, and you can be you while loving Jesus. You don't have to act a certain way, and I'm fortunate right now to work at a place where I'm allowed to talk about Jesus all the time, and I'm seeing kids come alive. Right now, I've got an FCA, what I lead, which is Fellowship of Christian Athletes, and I've got about, I want to say, eight or nine solid kids that are loving Jesus and pushing me to build this ministry. So if you might have saw my Facebook post, I'm looking for camp ideas because next summer they're saying, Coach, we're going. And I'm like, okay, well, all right, I'll figure it out, right? But this year was a, a very good year, I say, because, you know, the Bible talks about when one person comes to know Jesus, all of heaven rejoices. This year, I had two softball players come to know Jesus, and I got to baptize them on the softball field. And that is not me. That is not me. That is God who is moving. I'm just being open to say, hey, what, what's going on in your life? I know your family life is terrible, but Jesus is good. And if we're just open to sharing what he's done in our life, you don't even have to know the Bible com completely, because I don't. Okay, But if you just know what he's done in your life, and you tell other people about what he's done in your life, their lives will be changed. And I personally believe that if anybody comes to know Jesus... They cannot walk away the same person they are today. So I just encourage you uh, to listen to this message and know you are where you are, and it's not an accident. I didn't choose where I was going. He placed me where I am. And, you know, I couldn't be in a better spot. So where you are, just sow some seeds, and God is going to make it work. So. So good. So good. And Beeb, you know, you're hired to be a teacher and a coach. Like you could just go every day and just 
do your job and go home, right? But he makes the most of every opportunity. He's brought his students to church on Sundays. He might have gotten to meet them over the years. That is all optional, right? It's not part of the job description. But because of he's experienced what Christ has done in him, right, he's motivated to do that for others. So powerful. Zach available, maybe? Yeah, you go grab him. I think Blake might have gone to get to get him. Thanks, Beeve. All right, I'll wait just a second and see. Zach's going to share maybe about what's going on in his workplace. But I just want to encourage us this morning that God wants to use you in the same way He's using Beeve. If Zach gets to share a bit, God wants to use you the same way He's using Zach. And I think what um, I want to equip us in this morning is how to live and interact with those around us. And y'all might be so good at this already. And so please bring us your stories and your testimonies because we want to get that out to the rest of us. Um, But I want to give us a new, maybe a new model of evangelism for some of us that reflects verses two through six. And this has, I was taught this, and it has helped me so tremendously. Blake was saying that people might be in one or two camps. Like for me, I'm, it's so easy for me to talk to strangers about Jesus. If you're like, hey, go tell that person that you don't know that Jesus loves them. I'm like, great. I'm, I'm great with that. But if he's like, oh, go tell your next door neighbor that Jesus loves them, I'd be like, I don't want to do that. Um, so Blake said it's two camps. Like you might be more comfortable talking to strangers but you do not want to talk to the people you know. But some of you might be great with talking to people you know that don't want to talk to strangers. I don't know where you fall. But for me, being able to learn how to live authentically in front of people and in my relationships with people has changed everything for me. And so the first thing I want to give you is this mindset, okay? This mindset is that evangelism is not just one conversation, but it's many conversations. And um, it's not just one conversation about salvation. It's many conversations about the kingdom. It's what God is like, what is his ways are, his character, the way he operates, okay? When we see in the Bible, between Jesus and his disciples, we see one time in the Gospels that they preach the message of salvation. Most of the time, the message being preached is the gospel of the kingdom, Okay, so this is different. This is a cultural Christianity thing that we've inherited where we just preach the gospel of salvation. But really in the Bible, and what Paul is describing here is a preaching of the gospel of the kingdom. Now, within the gospel of the kingdom is the message of salvation. That's a key part, right? But that understanding of Jesus died for your sins, and if you repent of your sins and trust him, you go to heaven. Okay, that's like the central piece But that doesn't make, um, we need the full picture to understand what that means for us, why that's so transformative, why that we need that, right? When we see the picture of God's goodness, of his justice, of his mercy, of his generosity, of his redemption, his restoration, when we see what he's like, and then we hear that he made that possible for us to access through his death, burial, and resurrection, it's like, wow, wow. Right? But when we remove the gospel of salvation and we just present that to people and they haven't seen or experienced the goodness and the grandeur and the wonder of God and his ways, then we're really giving them, uh, we're, they're missing out on seeing the beauty of God. And the way Jesus did this, he went around talking about the kingdom all the time. If you read the gospels, it's the kingdom is like this. The kingdom is like this. This is the way I work. Y'all say this, but I say this. Y'all remember those little sayings? He's presenting the kingdom. And, and he, he is the epitome of Colossians 4, 5 through 6, right? He always had a right response for everyone. His life was gracious and attractive. I love reading that description, that exhortation of Paul and seeing, oh, that's Jesus. Jesus did that through and through. And that's the encouragement to us. That's the series that Christ is in you. So the master of this way of relating to people, the the master of presenting the kingdom in an attractive and gracious way lives in you. So we're ready to roll, okay? And the way Jesus did this is he often talked about the kingdom from ordinary daily interactions, okay? So you see, if you know the story of the woman at the well, Jesus goes to the well and he says to the woman, give me a drink. 
and she doesn't have anything to get the water, and they start talking about water, regular water, right? But then Jesus takes that daily social interaction, and he turns it to talking about living water, and he shares with her the truth of the kingdom. Or you might know the story about Jesus is trying to teach, and the and children are coming around and bothering him, okay? You might, um, depending on how much you love kids, you might have similar feelings during family worship on Sunday mornings, maybe about your own kids. Um, but the disciples are trying to get the children away. And Jesus says, no, no, let the children come to me. And he, he picks one up and he puts it on his leg and says, unless you become like a little child, you cannot enter the kingdom. Right? So what's he doing? He's teaching them. He's showing them this is what it's like. This is what it's like. His kindness, his words. And this is so powerful. This is such a powerful idea of evangelism because it was a process of discipleship. Coming to know Jesus, coming to know his ways. It wasn't this one conversation and, okay, I understand, I'm in. Right? It was this process. And that is a, what a lot of our journey to faith has been. It's understanding Jesus more and more. And Jesus invited people to follow him before they fully understood his ways. I love in Mark 8, after the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus says to his disciples, do you still not understand? Do you still not understand? And so he knew, like, it's going to take a long time to really get this thing. And that is why God has placed you around people who need to know him, but they're not going to just know him because we preach the message of salvation one time to them. They're going to come to know Jesus as they see your life, and they're going to experience the kingdom. Maybe, they, maybe they'll choose to want to follow Jesus or not, right? But he still showed everyone what he was like. And that is the, that is the freeing part, is that it, we don't have an agenda for anyone else, right? We only have an agenda for ourselves. And we're saying, I want to be an authentic follower of Jesus wherever God's placed me. And whatever's inside of me, I want to give that away. So what I want you to do is if you have a piece of paper and a pen, which you should under your chair or at a chair nearby, would you take a couple, a minute, and write down who are the people you interact with on a consistent basis? I would say this is daily or weekly. Who are the people you interact with on a consistent basis that do not, that, you know, Paul said, um, he's talking about living among unbelievers, So write down the people that you interact with that um, might not know God. You might have a group like my coworkers where you might write specific names, your neighbors, or you could write the ones that you talk to the most. Who are the people you interact with on a consistent basis, daily, weekly? Might be your family members that don't know God. Okay, you can keep going. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep talking, but you can keep writing. I would take this home, and this is your new prayer list. Okay, these are the people you are called to pray for. Pray for what's going on in their life. Pray, ask what's going on in their life so you know how to pray for them. Okay, these are the people that God has placed around you. You might be the only authentic expression of Jesus that they ever experience. You might be the only touch with a, the, they, can, they can get lots of touches with religion. They can get lots of touches with cultural Christianity, but you might be the only one that can give them an authentic picture of what Jesus and his kingdom is like. So this is your prayer list, okay? And then after you start praying, the next, the, the starting point is to stop compartmentalizing your life. If you've ever heard me do this teaching before, you've heard some of this, but I would have this habit of I'll talk to, about Jesus with you guys, And then with everybody else, no. And my heart was like, I don't want to weird people out. I don't want to put, I don't want to put that on people that don't want it. But what I was doing was creating kind of this inauthentic version of myself over here, right? Like I would give you all the example when y'all would ask how I was doing about having the, the baby, I would share about what God was doing in my heart through that. If someone else asked me that I, that didn't follow Jesus, I would give them some like non-Christian answer. 
So I really felt convicted about this because people need to know who are the ones around them that have the hope. Who are the ones around them that have the faith? Who are the ones around them that they can go to in a time of need? Because they might not need Jesus today, but they might need him next week, or they might need him next year, and they're going to need to know who, who can help me, right? Y'all know the story about my next-door neighbor. And she knew that we moved here, to, and we were pastors, and that always feels awkward. Like, we try to lie about our job sometimes just to not shut people down, like, from the get-go. Like, yeah, we work in nonprofit, and they're like, oh, what's your nonprofit? Like, oh, it's a church. I'm sorry. I'm a pastor. So our next-door neighbor, like, you moved here, you're starting a church, you have all these people at your house all the time, this is very strange, but we just continued to be friends and connect and talk, and, um, and then one day, she was having a really hard time, and she came over, and she's like, can I talk to you? And we went downstairs, we talked about what was going on, and we got to walk really closely together for over a year as she really encountered Jesus, and she now follows him. And it was hard to let that part of my life be known because I didn't know what that would feel like to her. But God used it. God used it. And so, for example, just if you edit your speech, my um, daughter's piano teacher, just this past week, she told me about this terrible situation that she's going through and a family member that's dying. And I wanted, and I was talking with her, and I wanted to say, I'm going to be praying for your family. Like, it's a terrible situation. If any of you told me what she's, you were going through, what she was going through, I would say, I am so sorry. I'm going to be praying. And I mean it. And when she told me that, I like, oh, man, I'm going to pray for this. But I did not want to tell her that. I did not want to say, I'm going to be praying for your family. It felt like, oh, I don't want to put that on her. But I'm like, no, that's true. It's true. And that is who I am. And I love God. And I love her. And I'm going to pray for her. So I told her, I'm going to be praying for your family. And she said, thank you so much. You know, just that, that integrating your life and just learning. You love God. That's okay. Like learning to talk about what God's done in you in just a natural way, however you would talk with one another. Matthew 5 says, you don't remember the song if you grew up in church, don't light a lamp and put it under a bushel, right? Like that's the, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, right? That's from the Bible. Don't, the, Jesus says, don't light a lamp. And put it under a basket, what good is that, right? It says, instead, let your light shine before men that they would see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Okay, so we're praying. This is supposed to be an equipping time for us to do this Colossians 4 life together. You're praying. I'll go left to right. You're praying. Now you're integrating your life. You're trying to just be who you are all the time, right? Not just be a Christian when you're around your Christian friends. Just integrate your life. And God's, and remember, Jesus is going to help you be gracious and attractive. We're not trying to become like crazy Bible beaters, right? We are following the way of Jesus. The, he was gracious and attractive. He had a right response for everyone. Okay, so we're learning to just talk and be normal. And next, we start asking, what opportunities do I have to display the kingdom? And this is where reading the Bible is really helpful because we start to see, oh, the kingdom isn't just about salvation, right? It's about generosity. It's about kindness. It's about honesty. It's about integrity. Where are opportunities that you have to model the kingdom, to show what it's like? So our our daughter's preschool teacher, she sends out a group text, hey, can anyone help me move on Saturday? No one responds. We respond. We'll help you move, right? We canceled our plans. We get Blake's truck. You know, you should always have a friend with a truck. We get Blake's truck, and we go, and we move, and we move her whole thing. And then she's like, I really need to find someone to weed eat this this backyard. Blake's like, I'll weed eat the backyard. He's like, are you sure? And he's like, of course. Okay, meanwhile, we talk about Jesus. Like, we write her notes, say praying for you. Her dad's going through something. I write a scripture, give it to her on a card. So we're talking about Jesus because that's just who we are. And we're looking for ways to practically serve her, okay? Um, We actually stepped out of that. We aren't going to go to that preschool anymore because we're going to be all at home together. Pray for me. Um, And I was telling Blake, like, you know, nothing ever really came of that. We've been connected to her for three years, lots of intentionality. And it's just kind of like, okay, Lord, like, I don't know what that's going to turn into into her life, if anything. And the other day... We were driving, Blake was driving home, and he saw her in our, one block from our house. And he's like, hey, what are you doing over here? She's like, I just moved in right here. 
<laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, you gotta be kidding me. So we've actually followed each other to four different places now. Audubon Elementary, the preschool, the other preschool in our neighborhood. So it continues. So I was thankful to God for that. Okay, so encouraging people. I noticed this about you. I just wanted to encourage you. I saw you treat that customer so kindly. I, I, you might not be a really religious person, but for me, my faith, kindness and is really important. I just want to tell you I admired that about you. You know, just speak life. To call out people like, hey, that was really bold of you. Hey, that was really kind. Hey, that was really generous. I really admire that about you. That is the kingdom. Live integrously. That is a huge way to model the kingdom. And do excellent work. I don't know if Blake told you this story that he's mowing lawns and his uh, client asked him to raise her price. Did he tell you all that? He said, she said, raise my price at $5 a week, 20 bucks a month. I'm like, why? Because he does excellent work. And she saw that. Okay, so now his life is, has integrity because he says one thing and then he lives it out in the same way. Okay. Finally, okay, so we're praying. We're integrating our life. We're looking for opportunities to model the kingdom. And then finally, ask for wisdom for gracious and attractive responses. There will be opportunities to talk about God. There will be opportunities to talk about meaningful, deeper things that lead to conversations about faith. And when those topics come up, just take a second and say, okay, Holy Spirit, help me respond to this in an attractive way that draws people to you. One of Nora's um, classmates, her mom and I got to be good friends, and we hung out quite a bit. And one day she just said to me, how are you so calm with your kids? And I could have been like, oh, I'm not calm with my kids, trust me. You know, but I was like, okay, that's really Jesus is the reason I'm calm with my kids. But I'm not going to be like, it's Jesus. I'm like, okay, Holy Spirit, what's a gracious response? And I said to her, I did not grow up in a calm home. I actually grew up in a really scary home. And it's only God that's helped me live differently than I grew up in. And she was like, okay. And she said, wow, I never knew that about you. And so, you know, just that moment of like, let me have a, a Holy Spirit-led response. I was at the physical therapist, and she had um, heard about Antioch. She had some family members that went to Antioch and Baton Rouge. She said, is your church evangelical? And I'm like, hmm, okay. I could be like, that just means like you preach the gospel. That's like the technical definition. But I know that that's actually a really loaded term and that it could mean a lot of things to different people. So I could have been like, uh, no, not really. Or I could have been, yeah, sort of. But I was like, okay, Holy Spirit, let me think about this for a second. So I was like, uh, you could do that. Uh, what do you mean by that? And I asked her, what do you mean by that? She was like, don't y'all like go out and like tell, like preach at people? I was like, oh, like I said, well, we do, we do talk about Jesus. And like, I do talk about Jesus with people out and about, but that to me sounds like kind of like religious and harsh. And I don't think Jesus was like that. So I don't say I'm evangelical. And she was like, oh, that makes sense. So, you know, it's just these like little moments of being led by the Holy Spirit. Okay, Connor, I love your story about at his office, there's a whiteboard and people would write quotes on the whiteboard. Is this right, Connor? You started it. Okay. There was a whiteboard, and Connor, Connor, started write, Connor started writing quotes on the whiteboard every day, and people would come. People started to be excited to see what was on the whiteboard, and Connor would write scripture with no scripture reference. So it just he wrote, "The life of the generous gets bigger and bigger. The life of the stingy gets smaller and smaller." So people like ask him about that, and so he's looking for opportunities, and he's he's using wisdom to have gracious and attractive responses. It's so cool. A good tip, if you're like I'm, I could never do anything that you're saying right now. You can, uh, but a good tip would be, you can all if you're not good on the spot, you can use this trick. Hey, I was thinking about our conversation the other day, right? Like if Beck said to me, that was my my friend. She's like, how are you so calm with your kids? And I'm like oh, I'm just, I don't know, uh, uh, whatever. Or like, oh, I'm not that calm. If later I was like, why didn't I just tell her, like, Jesus has really changed my life. Like, I grew up in a really crazy home, and he's transformed my whole life. Next time I saw her, I could be like, hey, I've been thinking the, about the conversation. I've been thinking about the question you asked me the other day about why I'm so calm with my kids, and now here's my answer. <laughs> you can do that. That's not cheating. Like, if you're like, oh, I should have said that. Like, okay, say it tomorrow. 
know. That's the awesome thing about being placed where you are is that you're there for a while probably. Okay? So just get comfortable. And the thing that is so fun about this is the more you do it, the more all in you are. Right? Like now the piano teacher, like, she knows I have five kids. She knows where pa- I'm a pastor. She knows I pray. Like, Nora sometimes knits headbands and, like, wears them to piano. I'm like, she's just going to think I'm this, like, homeschool Christian, five kids. My daughter knits her own headbands. But I'm like, oh, well, like, I'm all in, right? That's how she experiences me. So at least let her experience Jesus, right? So I would encourage you, just keep going. Just keep going. And the great thing is, is we, people can take it or leave it, right? When I say that Jesus is the reason I'm calm with my kids, I'm not like, do you want to know him? Right? Like, I just told her. She's like, oh, wow, I didn't know that about you. Right? But now she knows. Now she knows. So we don't, we don't put anything on other people, but we make it known who Jesus has been to us. That's the Christ in me. All right. So as we close, I know I'm making this simple, but I acknowledge that it is not easy. And that is why we need each other. That's why we come to church. Okay, we don't come here to hear the sermons. They're not always that good. Just come here. Just come here because we're going to be equipped in Jesus together, right? We're going to get in God's presence together. And that is why we come so that we can be sent out, equipped and empowered into back to the places that he has us. And then we come back seven days later, like, come next Sunday. I'll be here. Like, you come back next Sunday. Be like, how to go? Anybody try anything? Anybody have anything to share? Like, that is what we want to create here. That is what the church is supposed to be. So as we end, turn to one or two people around you. And with that list, like, you can keep the list to yourself. You don't need to say all the names that you wrote down. But what share what is an opportunity that you could make the most of with the people around you? Like, think back the past couple weeks, envision your relationships with these people, and what is an opportunity to serve, encourage, give an attractive response. Just share with each other. And if you don't know, just listen to other people's ideas. Maybe that will spur you on. So, Avery, can you come back up when you're done talking to Connor? No rush. Um, So turn to one or two others. Tell them your name and share an opportunity that you could envision with these people on your list, okay? We'll take five minutes. I'm going to wrap it up. Sorry, I'm interrupting those who are talking. We can keep talking about this. We can keep talking about this in our house churches, after church. Y'all can bring it back in. Thanks for sharing. Okay, and last thing I want to say as we close, y'all can wrap up. As Jesus and his kingdom come together for people, there will be opportunities to do more explicit types of evangelism, like talk, sharing the gospel, reading the Bible together. Those ha- that has happened to me multiple times, that as I'm living this out with people, as I start to see that God's doing something in someone's life, I will say, would you want to get together and read the Bible together? And I've never had someone say no. It's just such an easy offer. And my neighbor actually led herself to Jesus reading the Bible, or the Bible letter to Jesus as it often does. And so there will be opportunities, but your life and your words can show people Jesus. And I hope that we can live that out together, that we can have the same rich calling together as we read in Colossians 4. Blake wrote this letter to the church in New Orleans. It might sound something like this if we all keep up with living this together. Dear church, we are sending you Reed and Rachel because they are a beloved brother and sister who serve us in the Lord's work. Mr. Alfred sends his greetings. He is always thinking about you and praying for you. If Chase and Casey haven't had their baby yet and are able to see you again, make them feel welcome. Say thank you to the Manleys for hosting House Church and allowing us to use their space. Remember Stephanie at Children's. She's working hard, but she remembers you constantly. Pray for Truman and Ashley as they take a step of faith to start a school that is founded on kingdom principles and discipleship. 
Also, think about the law school students and the grad school students as they represent Jesus through excellence and endurance through a tenuous time. Think about Miss Karen as she takes care of sick family members and shows them the kindness of God. Our friends who are missionaries to the saints, pray for them, especially the ones that protect the quarterback. That is the family of God that we're all invited to be a part of. And it's easy to go through Monday through Saturday just living for ourselves, but there is something so much better for each of us. And as we say yes to doing it together, I promise you there will be a richness to your life, an inheritance in heaven, and God's going to use you in the lives of those around you. So to close, would you stand with me? Just want us to put a hand on the shoulder of the person next to you. I'm just going to pray that throughout the Bible, whenever people were sent out, they laid hands on them and sent them out to the places that God was sending them in the power of the Holy Spirit. We can't do this stuff on our own, right? Tomorrow you're going to wake up to a frustrating text message, right? There's going to be real life things that you have to deal with this week. It's only by the Holy Spirit. Sweetie. It's only by the Holy Spirit that we're able to live this way. So don't try to do it on your own. It won't work. But I'm going to pray for us. Jesus, we thank you for this church that you've put together in this city at this time. God, we thank you for the calling of the gospel that you've placed in each of us. Lord, and I thank you for every unique personality in this room. I thank you for every unique story. I thank you for every unique vocation and calling. I thank you for the unique neighborhoods and the unique families and the unique jobs that you've placed each of us in. God, we ask that you would fill us all with your Holy Spirit that we would be empowered to live for you, that you would give us a heart for those around us, that we would pray for those around us, that you would give us creative opportunities to serve and to show what you're like. God, and I ask that you would give us the right words at the right time. Would they be gracious and attractive? Would, they, would we point people to you? Lord, and would you use this body, would this community be the greatest thing that we're a part of? Would this be our greatest place of hope and joy, God, would we come together with uh, stories of what it's like living for you and when we spur one another on that we might obey you together, that when we stand before you that we would hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And I bless each and every person today to be pastors where you've placed them. And we thank you that you go before us and that you are within us. And we thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Way to go, pastors. All right, so...